Finding the additional content in Dark Souls 1 is notoriously convoluted. You first have to defeat the Hydra mini-boss. Beyond the mini-boss is a cove that'll be empty if you go there straight away, but if you reload or somehow decide to come back later, you can then free an NPC that's captured inside this crystal golem. You then have to interact with this NPC to move her to her next location. And then, much later on in the game, in a distant and seemingly unrelated location, another crystal golem will drop the broken pendant, a key item required to access the DLC. But this enemy will already be here even if you didn't rescue the NPC first, in which case they won't yet drop the pendant and you would have to come back later. So a lot of players might not get anything out of this and move on without thinking anything of it, missing it entirely. But even if they did get the pendant, the item description isn't totally explicit that you have to go all the way back to the cove one more time to finally find the entrance. The DLC contains three different levels and what is widely considered to be some of the best boss fights in the game, which is all very easily missable if you didn't know to follow these steps. It's kind of ridiculous for a game to do this, right? Now, I'm not here to convince you that this isn't needlessly complicated, but there is a context that I think is missing for people who didn't play Dark Souls until after the DLC was already out. A commonly asked question is, how did players discover this in the first place? Or how were they expected to find it? What I would like to clarify today is two key points regarding this. It was never really a mystery. And even if it was a mystery, I can guarantee that it would have been solved by the community on day one. We'll of course start with the first point. I realize this might be a somewhat disappointing answer if you're hoping for neat stories on the community working together to figure this out. Because that never had a chance to happen. Not that anyone individually didn't find it on their own, and for those who didn't read the published instructions, finding it was easier than you might think. But yes, there were published instructions, which is why it was never a mystery in the first place. On the Wayback Machine, you can find an archive of From Software's official blog detailing exactly how to enter. I'll throw some images of both the original Japanese text on the screen and a machine translation into English if you'd like to pause and take a closer look. But that's not the full story. This was published on the 26th of October in 2012. The DLC on consoles had already been out for a couple days, and the Prepare to Die edition on PC, which debuted the additional content, came out a couple months earlier. So did that give everyone a couple months to figure it out on their own? Not really, there were unofficial guides up on the day it launched. And the presence of these guides was known to the community. There's not a single person who would have asked at the time who wouldn't have gotten an answer. Some of these day one guides were a little rough on the details to be fair, perhaps not clarifying the entire order of operations correctly, but all of the major points were locked down within a day. People knew you needed to free Dusk, where to get the broken pendant, and where to find the entrance. I don't have any direct proof of this, and most of the contemporary resources are seemingly lost to time now, but given how quickly gaming sites and forums at the time disseminated information on this, I've always suspected that Bandai Namco shared this information directly with a few gaming publications. That's probably how we hit the ground running with this. In fact, we have a day one video crediting Epic Name Bro. So if you already knew this information immediately upon release, that means one of two things. There was a pipeline where this information made it to the community sourced from people with inside knowledge. Or if people like him did have to find it on their own first, then they must have had early access and were then able to inform the community right away. But this brings me to my second point. What if we didn't have any of these resources when it launched? I'm still extremely confident that it would have been solved on day one, and published resources probably would have only lagged by like a day or so at worst. All of the steps that I opened this video with, it's extra convoluted without any context, but you have to remember that the player base was not going in blind. Dark Souls had been out for almost a year on the PS3 and Xbox 360, and a lot of people were looking forward to its release on PC. The knowledge that players went in with would have made this very easy to solve, and I can break that down with four different reasons. Number one, rescuing Dusk wasn't a mystery. Dusk was not a new character added for the DLC, she was in the original version of the game. Most of the interactions you can have with her in the Darkru Basin weren't new. She did get a new batch of dialogue after defeating Manus, but that's it. A major sticking point that makes finding the DLC feel impossible is how many times you have to reload the cove after defeating the Hydra but players were already doing this regularly. Getting the Crown of Dusk required reloading the cove after rescuing her, which was a highly desirable item for spellcasters. Basically, for anything relating to Dusk, we already knew that reloading and checking the cove was part of the routine. Number two, we already knew the DLC had something to do with Artorius and Ulysil. The expanded content was known as Artorius of the Abyss, and in the marketing leading up to its release, it was spelled out in no uncertain terms that it took place in Ulysil in the past. 
And even if returning players missed the marketing and went in blind, while the broken pendant didn't explicitly say where to go, it gave you a pretty big hint by referencing Ulisil. With Dusk already having dialogue like this in the base game, people would have known to check in on her. She kind of wouldn't shut up about it. I am Dusk of Ulysil. My home, Ulysil. The sorceries of Ulysil. Ulysil's sorceries. And regarding Artorias, though his final grave was up above in the Darkroot Forest, his location in the forest, combined with Dusk's location in the basin, made it clear to a lot of players that the DLC had something to do with Darkroot. Even before the DLC came out, it was speculated in the lore community that Ulysil was Darkroot in the past, speculation that turned out to be correct and would have set players on the right track. I'll have more to say about the location of Artorias' grave in a second, but how are we supposed to know where to find the broken pendant in the first place? Number 3. This stuck out like a sore thumb. This crystal golem wasn't always here, so even if players hadn't rescued Dusk and the pendant didn't drop for them, this would have been highly suspicious to most returning players. There were only a few subtle changes to enemy placement between the original unpatched version of the game and the earliest patches. Most of the major placement changes were to really obscure stuff like Gravelord Black Phantoms and Vagrants, something the community never had a chance to get familiar with. So finding this here didn't feel like a routine change among the balancing changes that also launched with the DLC. It stood out as being special in some way. And just a quick tangent here, but the way they added this is kind of interesting. Instead of putting an entirely new copy of the enemy into the map, they took one from the Crystal Forest above and moved it down here. But this means that, unless you played the original console version of the game prior to the DLC patch, you never got to see the original layout of the Crystal Golems up here. This one, nearest to the ladder, originally had the Broken Pendant Golem next to him. And finally, number 4. People already guessed the location of the DLC before it was even out. This is where some neat investigation from the community had a chance to happen before it was spelled out for us. The trailer for the DLC showed snippets of the cutscene where the player gets pulled in, and a lot of people noticed how it looked an awful lot like the cove. So players were already going to be looking here, and of course that turned out to be correct. Here's an example of several people talking about the cove being the likely entrance. It's neat seeing the speculation on how it would connect exactly. They're not all 100% correct, but this was the general expectation. And that's not all. The location of Artorias' grave was brought into the discussion at the time in an interesting way. This was all happening not very long after the map data first started being data mined and explored. Someone used the map data to help make a connection between the cove and Artorias. They noticed that the cove was beneath Artorias' grave and offered this as additional evidence of the cove being the likely entrance. Unfortunately, I can't find the original discussion on this and I don't know who to credit. If you can find it, please leave a comment and I'll link it below. Here's another look when we move straight up above the far end of the cove. We see that it puts us directly in Sif's arena, near his tombstone. This might seem like a random geographical detail that doesn't matter, because we essentially get teleported into the DLC instead. It's not like we fully tunnel our way in from down here, but I do think this speculation was onto something. If you weren't already aware, the Colosseum where we fight Artorias and his grave during the present day are not in the same location, nor are they meant to be. I'll link to another video I made that provides more detail on this, but his grave was moved to be further away from the Abyss, up to where it could be protected, the Sanctuary. Granted, the actual boss room where we fight the Sanctuary Guardian would be a little behind that, so when we get pulled back in time, we're not going directly above where we are in the cove, it's more like we're going somewhere behind and to the right a bit. Remember that the lake where we fight the Hydra is the same space we fight Calamite. To give you a good reference point, we've got the same waterfall and ladder here. And then over in this corner, we even have a small nook where the cove is starting to form. So when we're getting grabbed by Manus into the DLC, we're essentially being teleported from here to over here. I think the placement of this cove beneath Artorias' grave was considered by the developers, and it's fitting that in uncovering the legend of Artorias, we essentially tunnel straight up to where his grave should be, yet we don't find anything familiar there. Through subtle environmental design, they wanted to convey that if his grave was a lie, then we don't know the full story, and that what we've heard might only be legend. The legend of Artorias are none but a fabrication. Early marketing materials talked about the Tomb of Ulysil or the Tomb of Artorias being a landmark of the DLC, and we sort of got that? There's a shot in the trailer of the player walking into the Sanctuary Guardian's arena backwards, and I always felt like this was meant to convey the idea that we'd be descending into a tomb of sorts, 
It's not exactly what we got, but something to remember about the DLC is that it wrapped up some unfinished concepts that were already in mind at the time the base game was designed. The physical maps of the DLC didn't already exist as cut or prototype content, mind you, only rough elements within it, but the general idea of uncovering the past of Ulusil was something they always had in mind. What I'm saying is, the placement of this cove was very likely part of a half-baked idea that never fully came to fruition. I'm going to assert that the entire reason this is down here is because they had some vague notion of being able to explore the grave of Artorias. While we didn't get a solid physical connection between the areas, and there was nothing to really unearth in the grave itself, they probably settled on a cutscene that pulls you in, because that was a lot easier. So that hopefully wraps up any questions you might have had about how the entrance to the DLC was found, or was supposed to be found. I realize some viewers are probably wondering how the heck a new player who wasn't looking up guides was supposed to know. This was fine, sort of, for returning players, but expecting new players to figure this out, and hiding that much important game content behind it, is still kind of ludicrous. And yeah, this is all to say that the DLC was absolutely, definitely designed with returning players in mind, specifically. No one is saying that this was a great idea, but for the players they had in mind, it wasn't as big of a stretch as you might think, and you can see how they got here. This was their first DLC for a Souls game, as Demon Souls didn't have one. They were charting new territory, and a recurring design element for these games is that they want to lean heavily on in-universe tools and concepts for their mechanics. There's a reason these games don't have PvP or co-op lobbies in their starting menus. For better or for worse, they want you to have your character handle that stuff seamlessly in-game. This is the same reason there's no easy start button for warping into the DLC. The later Souls games continued to do this, but they handled it better, in ways that weren't as convoluted. Dark Souls 1 was rougher around the edges in a lot of ways, and that's to be expected. If I could have fixed accessing the DLC without completely overhauling it, there's just two changes I would have made. It would make it so a quit and reload wasn't required for making the Crystal Golem spawn after defeating the Hydra. There are various triggers in the game that can cause NPCs to instantly spawn without reloading. For example, if you could kill the Capra Demon remotely from Firelink Shrine, which is exactly what I'm doing here, Rhea and her party would spontaneously pop into existence right in front of you. It's extremely unlikely that someone would run all the way into the cove while fighting the Hydra, and if you were somehow caught off guard by this popping into existence, it's probably better to die learning about its presence rather than not encountering it at all. Having the Golem spawn right in as the Hydra died would have cut out the most egregious quit and reload needed to discover Dusk. Killing the Hydra is when you're most likely to explore back there. The second is that I wouldn't have made the Broken Pendant conditional. Just have this enemy drop the Broken Pendant, regardless if you've freed Dusk or not yet, and that also would have helped a ton. With these two changes, I don't think the convoluted nature of accessing the DLC would be half as infamous as it is today. Oh, and by the way, I might have not been clear enough about this in my Ulusil was Darkroot in the past video. I ended with a tease that the corpse carrying the wolf ring is what became of Chester, that he never made it back to his home timeline, and this is what became of him. So, yeah, that's Chester. Or it would be if cut content validated it. But whether or not you accept that as your headcanon, this is what the developers considered at some point. Just a random fun fact to close with. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.